Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we were very excited to host. Uh, Algorand uh, founder Silvio Macaulay recently at our Crypto Bahamas conference in collaboration with FTX. But our goal at those conferences and our goal on these talks is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to bring you the latest episode of the Salt Crypto Show uh, presented by FTX. And our guest today is Stacy Warden, who is the CEO of the Algorand Foundation, which is an organi organization dedicated to enabling an inclusive, decentralized, and borderless global economy at scale based on the Algorand blockchain technology. Prior to her current role, Stacy was on the executive team of the Milken Institute, which is a leading financial think tank where she led its work on capital market development, crypto and blockchain solutions, and innovative uh, finance. Before Milk and Stacy led JP uh, Morgan's EMEA public sector practice out of London and worked in sovereign debt capital markets in New York. Before JP Morgan, she ran the NASDAQ's two markets for micro cap companies. Uh, she's also had senior roles at the US Treasury, the Center for Global Development, and the Harvard Institute for International Development. Uh, Stacy's done business and worked with governments in more than 50 countries and advised and spoken widely on the potential for crypto and blockchain to solve real world problems and improve global inclusion. She sits on the boards of the Global Blockchain Business Council, the Rwandan Capital Market Authority, and the Energy for Growth Hub. She serves on the advisory committees for the UN Capital Development Fund, the European Parliament Science and Technology Committee, and the US Financial Technology Association and Evolution Environmental Asset Management. Hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm uh, with a significant investment into the Algorand ecosystem and token. Uh, Anthony is also the chairman of SALT. And with that, we'll turn it over to Anthony to begin the interview. I mean, it's impressive background. I mean, who's kidding who's stays? All right, so what? Already, yeah, I mean, I mean, we probably trimmed the background, John Darcy. Okay, it's obviously an impressive background. So, so Stace, let's talk about this for a second. Okay, why Algorand? Because you have this amazing career. You obviously see what John and I see in DeFi. You were a traditionalist like us, an institutionalist. You were a trade fi person, if you will. Yeah. And so you could you could have had the pick of the litter of anything that you wanted to do. So let's start with that. Why the board, the CEO of the Algorand Foundation? Well, thanks, John, first of all, for making me seem so old, you know, right off the bat. But, uh, uh, you know, I think, Anthony, honestly, the road from TradFi to DeFi is one way. You know what I mean? When you start understanding deeply the, the potential of crypto and the potential of blockchain more broadly, you kind of never look back, honestly. I'm proud of what I did in TradFi, and I think it's been a great, um, you know, a great training ground, I think, probably for DeFi. But uh, this is where I think all the action is going to be going forward. You know, but throughout my career, I have always been very focused on you know, access to capital, that my, my I, I, you know, I believe that businesses grow and economies grow through private sector led growth. Private sector led growth needs to happen when small and medium sized enterprises have access to capital and households have better outlets for their savings. So that's kind of always been a North Star for me. You know, at the NASDAQ, I worked with the small and medium sized markets. I ran the two micro cap markets for the NASDAQ. And in, at JP Morgan as well, I worked on policy to, uh, it was public sector, but policy to help developing countries you know, grow their private sector through well-functioning capital markets, you know, and again, at the Milken Institute, underserved communities, smaller businesses, just with this thesis that well-functioning capital markets are going to drive growth through a private sector-led growth. And um, I got into crypto, you know, everybody has their kind of going down the rabbit hole story, right? Mine was in 2013. And I think my story is a little bit unique because I was approached by the National Institute for the Press to give a talk to the press on like, what is this Bitcoin thing in 2013? So unlike a lot of other people, I had to figure it out enough to 
speak about it for, you know, 90 minutes and like from, from kind of like day one. And so I really literally locked myself in my house for seven days. And the more I got into, I was listening to podcasts in Germany with Gavin and Dreesen on them and, you know, just trying to figure out. And when I internalized the mechanism of this proof of work that Satoshi Nakamoto came up with, I, I just, I couldn't believe how brilliant it was. And I couldn't believe, you know, the potential then. And I think Bitcoin was not quite fit for purpose and it was a little early and what I thought it might be able to do it, uh, you know, it wasn't sort of ready then. Um, but I had that feeling. Then. And then when I was at the Milken Institute, crypto was always kind of a side hustle for me more and more. And I can talk a little bit about that, but it became very clear that you need to go, you know, you need to go big or go home. And so when I was uh, headhunted to be on the board of the Algorand Foundation, I, I have to say, you know, I didn't know what it was. And I was pretty, I wasn't, you know, an OG or anything, but I had been in this space for a decade. And I thought I knew a fair amount of what was going on. And so I was like, what is this thing? And, you know, when you're going to serve on the board or something, you have to be quite careful because you're lending your name and you're lending your reputation and you're, and you want to move the dial with something that you think is going to work. You're going to be able to have an impact. And then, you know, the first thing you read is Sylvia McCauley and it's like, okay, Sylvia McCauley. <laughs> and then again, you know, um, as is my manner, I just dug into the consensus mechanism and I had that same feeling for the first time really that I had since 2013, like, oh, okay. I get it. This is going to be, this is the real deal. And this is going to be the, again, I think the platform that's going to move the dial for the things I care about. So that's how I agreed to join the board. And then in January, they made me the CEO. And so it's been uh, four, four months, you know. <laughs> yeah. And a, and a lot, a lot has happened in four months. And so since you brought up the Milken conference, uh, Last week at the Milken Conference, uh, Sylvia McCauley, alongside of the head of FIFA, announced a deal where Algorand will be the official blockchain for FIFA. And so, in your own words, Stacey, tell us about that. Tell us uh, how that came together. Tell us why you think that's important. I personally think it will enable Algorand to become a household name, just in terms of market saturation. But tell us how that came about and tell us what your thinking was there. Yeah, you know, um, it came And congratulations, about, by the way, congratulations as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it came about in a typically Algorand way. So I think a lot of these sports stadiums things, you know, they're run by the kind of the, the marketing department goes out and they spend a bunch of money and they get their name on a stadium, et cetera. And it was not that way with FIFA. The way it happened with FIFA is FIFA decided that there was blockchain potential for what they were trying to do. Kind of, you know, first of all, in the NFT space, NFT marketplace, maybe in ticketing and wallets, maybe in player trading, eventually like they understood. So they hired a consultant and they said, look, you know, we're a huge organization with a lot of, you know, name recognition. We can't do this improperly. We can't do this wrong. We don't know very much about blockchain. Which blockchain should we pick? And this consultant spent a couple of months and came back to FIFA and said, Algorand is the blockchain that you should do this with. And Why? so, uh, well, because we are built for scale, I would say, you know, we can handle and very small transaction costs, very light carbon footprint, tremendous uh, throughput, and very fast final settlement. So 4.5 second final settlement. All of these things are very important. The bigger the organization you are, the more stake can't go wrong, the more you're going to care very much that your blockchain never goes down, that your transaction fees are low, that you don't have a large uh, carbon footprint. You know, we can talk about all of that. But he approached Silvio. And said, look, you know, here's this opportunity. And then it then, of course, it's natural that you start exploring marketing and other kinds of, of uh, opportunities in the back of that. Now, the funny thing about this, though, is that I am getting personally a tremendous amount of credit for this on Twitter and, you know, all of this. But I, you know, we didn't really have anything to do with this. This was led by Silvio all the way. And, you, you know, Sean Ford, right? And he, you know, and he's a huge football fan. And so he gets like a little irritated with me. He's like, you don't even know anything about football. How come everybody's saying, oh, Stacy, great, great job the foundation is doing. And I, you know, it's true. Like, I mean, I know absolutely nothing about football at all. So. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're, we're proud of it, of course. But this was really driven by Silvio, you know, all the way. Yeah, you work in the, in the industry a long period of time. 
Um, when John and I have looked at Algorand and our research team looked at Algorand, our reaction to Algorand was, okay, this could be the token. This could be the currency that's used by Wall Street. Why? Scalability, low price, net carbon negative or car- uh, very, very reduced carbon footprint, um, but also no downtime in the uh, in the system. And so all of these things seem to be amazing. So let me ask you this question. A lot of people ask me, what, what do you think Algorand, the foundation, Silvio, other people around Algorand need to do to raise the profile? Like, wh- wh- why isn't Algorand there uh, now as opposed to where it is? And, and I'm not saying it's in a bad position, mm. given all of the technological prowess of Algorand and its advantages relative to others. Um, yeah. what, what, do, what do you think we need to do to make it what we all think it should be in terms of the realization of its potential? Yeah, I do want to add one thing to your list before I answer that, because it is critical. And that is the no forking and final settlement. I mean, this is better than TradFi, right? I mean, this kind of, remember a couple of years ago, this big move from T plus three to T plus two, they were so proud of themselves, you know, Um, but this is 4.5 second final settlement. And so this is where we think we are, and not to mention, of course, the the very low transaction fees and the low carbon footprint. This is where we are very competitive, I think, going up against TradFi type rails. And look, I I can't really speculate exactly on why we're not, you know, we should be, in my view, we should be a top five chain, 100%, and I am determined to do my part to get us there. Um, I think, though, there was a couple of things maybe in the beginning And I think, you know, we thought, at least I think at the foundation, we sort of thought, well, the tech will speak for itself. It is so obviously the best tech in crypto that the foundation didn't do enough to market, didn't do enough to get the name out, didn't do enough. Um, And then related to that, I mean, a little bit glib, of course, but I also think that there was maybe an idea a little bit of, you know, when the coin price is higher, then we should spend money because we'll get a better, you know, bang for our buck. And, you know, when I came in, I said, that's not that's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is that we need to do this now and we need to hire the people that we need to hire. And we didn't have enough kind of community people, for example. We didn't have enough people in developer outreach and engagement. We just didn't have, uh, you know, the bodies compared to especially compared to some of the other layer one chains to do the work. Right. And so we're very focused on building that now and making sure that we are, you know, we're built for success in the medium term. And then I think the other thing that the that Silvio and the engineers in the beginning decided, and I'm not going to call it a deal with the devil, but it was a very big decision to make, was that they decided solidity is not a good enough language. And so unlike other chains that can just fork from Ethereum and pull in a bunch of developers from day one, it's no big deal. You know, they have the library, they have all of that. They decided that this language is not fit for purpose for the scale that we want to go towards. And so it's hard in the beginning. And, you know, we are very um, grateful to the guys at Reach, for example, who who did a who's built a nice kind of Java script overlay onto the machine language, which is called Teal. And now we have PyTeal, which is a Python overlay. So now it's easier, I think, for developers to come and, and we're going to do a lot more to, to get them. But in the beginning, we made life a little bit difficult for ourselves by not just simply, you know, forking Ethereum and having our own uh, chain. Okay. I, I mean, all, all of that makes sense. And I, and I uh, you know, obviously we're, we're very big believers. What do you make of the current cryptocurrency bear market? You and I, unfortunately, have seen our share of bear markets, uh, but this seems to be a, a pretty decent rip-roaring one, somewhat similar to 2017. What's your reaction to the current bear market? You know, I don't love a bear market, I, I've got to say, but I do think that, you know, in the famous words of Warren Buffett, Buffett, when the tide goes out, we're going to see who's, uh, you know, who's swimming in their underwear, right? And so Algorand is uh, very, you know, on the tech and, you um, you know, on the community, we're very well positioned, I think, for, you know, for to survive that, uh, that tide going out. And um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I I'm, I'm, we, look, I'm very focused on the medium term and the long term and crypto is here to stay. 
and uh, we're going to be there and we're going to be strong when uh, when that when when markets recover. Okay, no, listen, I'm again, I'm agreeing, I'm agreeing with you, but apply tell some con, yeah, apply apply me. some context from your life experience why you believe that. Okay, so do you know that a person in Nigeria can send a person in Malaysia a movie over WhatsApp in five seconds, a movie. But that person cannot send a dollar to that person in Malaysia without traveling through the U.S. correspondent banking system, clearing at the Fed, traveling back down through the correspondent banking system. Somebody takes 12% off the top, right? And the idea of a blockchain that is one ledger where people, where everybody writes to one ledger, that is revolutionary. And there are some kinks to get out of that, of course. But I would argue that the last 10 years of financial innovation have been about making the messaging between different balance sheets go back and forth faster. And that's really all it's been. This is a new way of viewing the world where you are writing to one ledger and and the security that comes from that and the decentralization that comes from that. And, the you know, we are we are playing whack-a-mole now, right? If somebody shuts something down in one place, it can still survive someplace else. It's much more resilient. That idea is revolutionary. Now, on top of that, there's a number of different things that you can do that I think are equally revolutionary. First of all, you can understand the provenance of transactions and the ultimate um, uh, 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 final destination of transactions, right? So this is really, you know, blockchain is not truth, but it is integrity. And so once you are there, you understand the life cycle of something. You can, and this is very important, I think, for, for financial markets in particular, you can tokenize assets and you can tokenize them in, in, in smaller units, uh, as well, which adds liquidity to the marketplace in a way that we can't figure out how to do exactly in TradFi, right? And then third, I think just the, the ability for micropayments means that you can monetize things that you currently can't monetize. And so things that people, you know, and I think about this very much in a developing country perspective, you know, a woman on the street, she can monetize a couple of minutes of Wi-Fi, for example, or micro payments back and forth. And these kinds of things are not um, are not available right now because it's too chunky. And last, look, I understand the 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 the, the dirty money and the AML um, KYC and all of that, all of that. And I think it's very important. And you know, I will be the first person to say that regulation is important. But the other side of that is that crypto allows women in in countries where they don't have a lot of rights to keep their money from husbands and fathers and brothers right it allows you to to participate in in an economy which is in a way that is meaningful for you without having to reveal every single aspect of your identity you know an example that i like to give very often for this is when you get pulled over by the police that police officer needs to know that you own that car or have a right to drive it, that you are have a driver's license, that you are insured. But why does that police officer need to know where you live? You know, it's just not relevant to whether or not you're able to drive that car or not. And when a blockchain technology and the idea of a self-sovereign identity that underlies it, you can share the information that you need to share without having to share all of the information about you. And I think these things are revolutionary for how we think about this space. And I think Al Grant is in the best place to deliver on them. All right. I mean, subject. I mean, I got. As I mentioned to you before we went live, I have to turn it over to John Dorsey because he gets all the ratings, Stacy. Okay, so it's go ahead, ratings. John. It's I know it's all it's all about ratings, and it's all about ratings, as you know. So okay. go ahead, Dorsey. What 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 do you have for Stacy? Bring well, it on. First, I'd like to say, uh, as you alluded to, Anthony, we're major Algorand bulls. Twenty minutes into this conversation, I'm way more bullish than I was uh, now that <laughs> Stacy's running the show, and this is. Obviously, I'm flattering you, but I'm being honest. It's, it's great to hear your energy and, and your ideas. But you talked earlier. So our show, we cater towards people that are very deep into crypto, like you, Anthony, myself. We also cater to people who are still sort of learning about the space. And you alluded at the beginning of the conversation to the consensus mechanism that Algorand uses that's very novel and different than uh, what a lot of other blockchains use. Because you just Could you just describe that? in sort of layperson's terms for, for people who are watching this who are newer to the blockchain space? Sure, 100%. So Silvio Macaulay, who, uh, you know, as, as I think your audience knows, is a Turing Award winner, tenured professor at MIT, very famous cryptographer. 
And he invented a couple of things that the whole cryptocurrency ecosystem uses, uh, zero knowledge proofs, verified random functions. And he was in his academic life uh, watching the, the ecosystem use his core, kind of the core pillars of his technology. And I think he thought to himself, you know, I could probably build one of those that's a little bit better. You know, this is a little bit too expensive. The carbon footprint's a little heavy. Um, it's not quite fast enough, not quite final enough. The tech, I don't know, like I think. And so, you know, based on his name and his reputation, he was immediately able to raise money. Um, he was immediately able to raise a, a, a crackerjack team of cryptographers and computer scientists and management. And they uh, went live in 2019. And again, you know, it's never been down a second since. And the evolution that everything about the blockchain is the consensus mechanism. That is where all the juice is. And so a, so Bitcoin famously and then Ethereum came out uh, uh, later with, in a proof of work uh, consensus mechanism. And what you need to do in a blockchain is the idea of a blockchain is that all of these computers don't coordinate with each other. So you don't have a centralized database that is quite vulnerable. It can be vulnerable to attack and it, you have to trust the person that owns that database. So if you don't want to have be in that world, then what you need to do is have your database spread out over different computers that, that don't uh, know each other and don't have to trust each other. So, okay, well, how are you going to get them to agree? And here is why Satoshi Nakamoto is a genius. Everything about crypto was understood in the 90s. But what they didn't understand is how can these computers agree on the order of things without anybody telling them, without anybody coordinating across them. And he came up with a brilliant idea, which was that there's a, a longer and more nuanced version of this, but that these computers could sort of like run a race with each other. And whoever won that race would uh, be able to append the next block of transactions to the chain. So it had to be kind of easy or difficult to do, but then easy to check. And so it's difficult to append the block, but it is easy for all of the other computers to, to check that that is correct. So that is called the proof of work chain. Now, immediately, though, this lends itself to a bit of an arms race because you want to be fastest and you want to be best. And you want to be you want to append the block and you get paid in Bitcoin to do that or ETH to do that. And this is where the carbon footprint, the, the very heavy carbon footprint of Bitcoin comes in. Uh, all of the, you know, you put more and more computing firepower behind this. OK, so then a bunch of people came along and said, OK, that seems very, uh, you know, carbon intensive. And it's also not very fast uh, as well. So why don't we have and, 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 and people that are the most vested in the blockchain should be the ones that get to kind of append the next block. That seems reasonable. So we will, they, so they organized a, a, a proof of stake protocol, which is basically that the computers that kind of are the most vested, they have the most of the coin, they've maybe been there for the longest, a proof of history, they should be able to append the next block. Well, that is a much lighter carbon footprint off the bat. So that is very good, but it's got a couple of problems with it. First of all, the rich get richer. You know, so um, where if you have the most and you get to pay the next block and then you get paid and, you know, that's that. And then second, it's not super secure, right? Because everybody knows like that's the vector of attack. Like that guy with all the coins, like let's go attack. Let's go attack that. So Silvio um, uh, came up with something that's called a pure proof of stake. And what you do is you run like a little like think of it as like a little slot machine on your computer. And if you win you get to you get to propose the next block, and so um, then uh, then you run another one, you know, like a second later, and those guys kind of audit that that thing, and then and, and then one more time, it's three rounds to make sure, and then the third guys like say, okay, it's okay, and in that way, he has um, made it so that you can be very very decentralized because thousands of computers could be playing this game, but only one thousand are picked. Uh, to append the next block. It's by lottery, kind of. And nobody knows, you don't even know if you're going to win until you've actually won. So there's nobody, you you have no idea who to attack if you're a bad actor. And because it's only a thousand that are picked, um, it's very, got a very light uh, carbon footprint, even though it's being picked among so many, right? And on top of that, he said, you know, we don't necessarily need to reward people for participating in that consensus mechanism as well. As well. So it just it got the incentives properly aligned and it got what we call, and Vitalik Buterin famously said, you can't have scalability, security, and decentralization at the same time. 
And Sylvia McCauley said, oh, yeah, I think I can, actually. And so this pure, pure proof of stake consensus mechanism is how we is how we deliver on that promise. Yeah, and you talked about FIFA's decision to go with Algorand as its uh, blockchain partner, the ability to scale without outages. You know, we've seen outages uh, on some of the other proof of stake blockchains because of the very problem that you address, which is, uh, you know, whether it be bots going to mint NFTs or other uh, just big bottlenecks that, that build up in, in some of these proof of stake blockchains, Algorand has been able to avoid that using the, the consensus mechanism that you described, uh, which is amazing to see. One of the things I think that drove FIFA's decision as well, and that you guys talk about often when you're, when you're marketing Algorand is the light carbon footprint. And it's not just a light carbon footprint, you're actually carbon negative as a blockchain. Can yeah. you talk about what that means and how important sustainability is to Silvio and, and Algorand as, as an organization, a community? Yeah, 100%. So you can participate again. It's a little technical, but you can participate in this consensus mechanism from your laptop. And so by its very nature, you know, you don't have these like huge warehouses like Bitcoin does of these guys trying to participate in consensus. You participate from your laptop. So our carbon footprint, I have to say, it doesn't start off very high, right? It's about seven or eight houses. Right? Right. But still, we thought, and then we buy carbon offsets to make sure that we're negative. So when we do that, so then we thought, okay, well, we all agree that this is very important, but you know, we are a blockchain company after all. So we should lock in that commitment. And so we have transaction fees. There's sub penny transaction fees, but still we have transaction fees and we use, we commit our transaction fees as many as are required to offset any carbon footprint that we have. So we made that promise to ourselves and then we thought, okay, well, let's lock and on Earth Day. We announced we, we are locking in that promise by smart contract. So, you know, Earth loving CEO could get hit by a bus and then evil CEO, I don't think they'd ever hire an evil CEO, but, you know, could come in and say, look, I don't care that much about this. And it wouldn't matter. You know, our hands are now tied. Our fees from the top will go to uh, buying carbon offsets for however much carbon we generate. Now, you know, we don't generate that much carbon. Uh, so it's, you know, it's not that onerous, but then again, our fees are very low. So it's, it's quite a few transactions worth of fees to, to, to do that, but that's our, that's our promise. And yeah, we think that's uh, important. Yeah. And I, and I think since you've taken over, you're deferring credit for the FIFA partnership to Silvio, which is very gracious of you, but you've also done some other interesting stuff that has gotten attention from a marketing perspective. One of those was the takeover of Times Square uh, for Earth Day. Could you talk about that partnership, what you were trying to achieve uh, and how you're trying to educate people using that partnership? Yeah. Yeah. That was amazing. And I have to say, our, so what we did is we, we took over Times Square for an hour and we took over most every billboard in Times Square and we uh, turned it uh, green and then turned them off to show how much the energy Times Square uses, which by the way, is not very much. I mean, these are state-of-the-art LED screens, right? I mean, they are very, uh, they are, uh, very efficient, these screens. We turned them off and we said, okay, how many transactions with that amount of power, just to give a little bit of, a, of a, something that people can kind of grab onto, with that amount of power, how many transactions could you do on Algorand? And the answer is 350 million transactions. So then we said, okay, how many transactions on some of those earlier proof of work um, blockchains? And it's like 20, you know? So, okay, 350 million transactions. Well, how many, how long would it take to do by SWIFT, say, that, that many transactions? Well, it will take about a month. How long would it take to do uh, all of those transactions? The algorithm take about 90 hours or about two working weeks because crypto, as you know, is like 24-7, 365 days a year, right? We I think it's kind of funny that TradFi waits for the opening bell, right? So we we just wanted to demonstrate like how much you could get done on the Algorand blockchain because it's so energy efficient with the amount of energy that you um, use in Times Square. And, the, but you know, we have the best community, right? So the community came up, people were traveling in to see it. And then we had people like taking pictures everywhere. I mean, the whole thing was green and then black and then green. People were just looking around everywhere. It was so much fun. It was so much fun to do. Uh, yeah. And we got a good, little bit of a pop from it. So, yeah. I thought it was very smart the way you guys went about it. You yeah. know, you talked earlier, Anthony was asking you, given our belief, and I know your belief, that, that Algorand is a top five blockchain as it relates to the technology and, and the consensus mechanism and everything that's um, 
everything involving Algorand. Uh, but, you know, in terms of market cap and adoption, it still lags uh, behind where we think it, it could and should be. Uh, and, and you've done various things to tackle awareness and education around why Algorand is the, su- the superior uh, proof of stake protocol, uh, sure. as, well as, um, as well as making it easier to develop uh, applications on top of that. The Algorand Foundation recently launched the Algo Foundry, which is a venture studio dedicated to growing the developer ecosystem. Could you talk more about uh, how you guys are doing that? You touched on it earlier, but talk more about that and how you're optimistic about increasing development on the chain? Yeah, when, I, when I'm asked about my three strategic priorities, my three strategic kind of uh, communication audiences, I say it's uh, developers, developers, and then developers. And then the, the number four is you know, up there, but it, those are the top three. And so Algo Foundry is uh, one example of us partnering. You know, they've already built a number of important things on the Algorand blockchain. So they have a, like a multi-sig vault already that they've built. They built a kind of a decentralized options um, uh, platform for us. And so we thought we would partner with them as one example of a couple of different initiatives we, we have kind of in the works on this to find, to do training of developers, but with a little bit of an end in sight so that they can actually work on real world problems that these guys are working on for Algorand. So it's part, it's an important component of a, a wide ranging, very uh, important initiative that we have globally to attract developers, make developers feel loved, and to improve the tools that developers are given so that they can build on Algorand. So, yeah. Right. And and as Anthony alluded to earlier, we've seen some relative strength from Algorand during this bear market. So, you know, when I'm looking at my uh, in my watch list and I'm, I'm pulling up all these different assets that I track, Algorand has been the lone green bastion uh, during some of these ugly days or during these pullbacks. Do you think we're starting to see either greater awareness around uh, Algorand due to some of these partnerships? Do you think the developer activity is responsible for that? What do you owe this recent relative strength to uh, within Algorand? Well, as you know, I never comment on market movements at all. And uh, there's no uh, financial advice or anything like that uh, given on the back of this. But I think... Look, this is a culmination. You know, we've been laying the groundwork for this for a long time. And, you know, when I talk, when I, you're asking me kind of what the things that we're working on, I mean, but when you think about what Algorand Inc. is working on with state proofs and moving to 10,000 transactions per second and from four, I mean, we're at 4.5 settlement, um, second settlement. We're, they're moving to 2.5. I guess 4.5 isn't fast enough for them. They want to go to 2.5 second final settlement, no forking. I mean, all of these things, you know, people are just be it starts to sink in after a while how much better this tech is and how much better, you know, I, I will say, I'm biased, of course, but the community is. And when you get these partnerships and, and FIFA is the is the biggest, but it is not the only, you know, we are, we are also closing on a number of important real world partnerships. So, for example, in disaster relief payments, I mean, we are working with a couple of organizations in the United States to help them through a self-sovereign identity process and through Algorand blockchain, make payments for disaster relief victims. So this is going to be a game changer for these guys. And it's these use cases, and we've got a, a great partnership now brewing in Africa to, to, to uh, on a mobile, we'll be a part of, a, of the tech stack of a really interesting mobile financial inclusion play in Africa. As these things just keep piling up, we're going to have more and more real world use cases. At the same time, building up the DeFi and the more DGen crypto ecosystem, of course, but, you know, we can't, you can't help but succeed when you've got so many, so much firepower out there. Right. And, and you talked about some of the initiatives going on in places like Africa. You served as a minister level advisor on capital market development in various places across the world. You worked in EMEA, you've, you've worked in Africa. We tend to have a U.S. centric mindset when we think about the development and adoption and things like that. But I feel like globally, Algorand is particularly strong. And as we've talked uh, on Algorand's behalf to various governments across the world, business leaders across the world, it resonates a lot in different areas of the world, from being Sharia compliant uh, for people in the Middle East to groups in Asia who who are less uh, enthusiastic about the DGEN aspects of crypto and more about building on top of really uh, energy efficient and, and quality rails. Could you talk about globally uh, how you think Algorand stands out in terms of partnering with global governments and business entities? Yeah, let me say something more broadly first. Um, you know, we've really in the last few years 
come to appreciate, I think, the privilege that we have in many different areas. And I think when we start telling developing countries, oh, crypto, you know, the IMF has now just given guidance to Argentina that they shouldn't be too involved in crypto. Right. I think of that as very much what I call dollar privilege. Yeah, that's really easy for you to say when you're in a, sitting in a well-functioning economy where the central bank governor is doing more or less the right things in your view and market is are very deep. Um, it's not the same thing in the large majority of this world. And crypto, I mean, you know, there are countries in Africa where you can't open a bank account unless you get a letter from somebody else at that bank that's that vouches for you. Like just all kinds of nonsense, right? And so, and this idea that financial inclusion starts with a bank account, the idea that it doesn't have to be like that and that you can send it with its sub penny transaction fees, money back and forth, you know, the guy from Malaysia to the gal in, in, in Nigeria or whatever the example is, like that, when you think about the 1.7 billion people in this world that don't have access to finance that are not part of what we call sort of the inclusive global financial system, well, what kind of a blockchain is going to be able to deliver that? A blockchain that does, you know, 12 or 20 transactions per second or a blockchain that can, is going to get to 10,000 transactions per second by, uh, you know, in the next couple of months? Is it going to be a blockchain that, you know, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's not up? Or is it going to be a blockchain that's never been down for a second since it since it started? Is it going to be a blockchain with very high gas fees or is it going to be a blockchain with subpenny transaction costs? Like when you think about that scale, 1.7 billion people, then you better have a blockchain with a low carbon footprint with enormous transactions per second that settles immediately and that, can, well, you know, basically can handle it, right? And so we can handle it. And, and that's why we're very, we're very bullish on our ability. I mean, frankly, just to make a difference in the world, to have real impact in, in the things that I think drive prosperity and growth. Very well put. So I want to leave off with the future. You talked about how priorities one, two, and three for the Algorand Foundation is energizing development, uh, developer activity on the chain through various initi initiatives. These uh, programming language overlays, I think, are going to be instrumental in that. Could you talk about what are your strategic priorities uh, for 2022 and beyond over the next five years or so? Yeah. You know, when I think of it, this, you know, I, I like to say maybe it's like, you know, we're, we're, I'm living on Planet Algorand. I'm trying to make the economy of Planet Algorand as big as possible. Right. And so when I think about that, there's a couple of different strategies behind it. One is people need to learn the language of Algorand. So this is where we're going after developers and entrepreneurs and um, explaining to them how. Other languages might be a little bit kind of, you know, your failure, your success could be your demise because they can't handle the scale. Whereas, you know, we can handle anything that you throw at it and any kind of scale that you can bring. So we are, you know, trying to make that case and making sure that the developer ecosystem is supported and is as large as possible. Second, we believe very much in a multi-chain world. So we need to make sure that liquidity can go back and forth between, you know, say, let's say between planets easily. And right now, as, as, as we know, there have been some issues with bridges in a couple of different areas. And Algorand Inc., the brainiacs over there at Algorand Inc., are working very hard on something called state proofs, which will allow smart contract-based bridges between ecosystems. And so if we, and when we roll that out, um, and we are, we have no pride of ownership of this, by the way, we, we'd like to form a kind of a state proofs alliance where other ecosystems could use it because it would be to the benefit of everybody that, um, that we have this. So that would be, you know, to en enable kind of liquidity to port back and forth is the second component of that strategy. And the third component of that strategy is, uh, EVM compatibility. So you live on your ecosystem. You like the vibe there. You know, this is a thing in crypto, the vibe, vibe capitalism. You like the pizza, you know, you like the food over where you are, but why can't your, those dApps execute on an, on an Algorand environment, execute on planet Algorand. And so we think about these as the three ways of growing this ecosystem. And so we have you know, in East Denver, we announced a big grant for EVM uh, compatibility. We announced a big grant, a $10 million grants for, for better dev tools. So it's all in service of the strategy to get developers, learn the language, port liquidity safely back and forth, and have applications execute that are, that are built somewhere else, be able to execute in our environment. And I will tell you, and this may sound a little cocky for me to say it, but I think in a purely multi-chain world, finals, things will settle in Algorand. So you can be in your world, you can, you know, enjoy your food, but you'll, you'll settle in Algorand because 
it's fast, it's cheap, it's reliable, and you know why? Why wouldn't you? From your mouth to God's ears. But uh, again, it's been great talking to you to see your energy and your clear vision about where you're taking what we think is this amazing piece of technology and scaling it. Uh, is it's great to see. And Anthony, I want to leave the final word to you uh, before we well, let Stacey go. Well, listen, I mean, I, first of all, congratulations on everything that you're doing and congratulations on the strategy. Uh, and of course, you have all of this great execution experience. So we're very confident that you're going to be able to execute this. And we want to be there to help you, of course. Uh, and uh, And let me tell you this, you know, Silvio, to me, uh, and John said it once, you know, we're in the process of writing a book on Al Algorand. We call him the blockchain da Vinci. <laughs> Ultimately, he, cre he has created something. I think it's going to withstand the test of time. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, I've been watching this podcast for a long time, and I'm so deeply honored to finally be on it. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Well, it's great. Great to have you. And thank you again to Stacey Warden for joining Salt Talks. And thank you for everybody for tuning in to today's Salt Talk with the CEO of the Algorand Foundation. A just a reminder, if you missed any part of this episode or any of our previous episodes, you can access them on our website at salt.org backslash talks or on our YouTube channel or podcast feed. Our YouTube channel is called Salt Tube. Uh, we're also on social media. Twitter is where we're most active at Salt Conference, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well. And please spread the word about these salt talks, whether you're uh, a lay person who's still getting educated around blockchain or you're somebody who's deep in the space and uh, they need a reminder about why Algorand holds such, such high potential uh, in terms of becoming that base layer, uh, please spread the word. But on behalf of Anthony and the entire salt team, this is John Darcy signing off from Salt Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon.